Hey guys, Spacey here, and welcome to Cora's podcast, Filmmaking, actually. Cora was honored to host a workshop for the Organization of Independent Filmmakers entitled How to Make a Great Film on a Deadline. In this episode, part two of the workshop, Cora continues to cover how to make a great film on a deadline and gives you an overall understanding of the tentpole aspects that can help to make sure that your film holds up. So enjoy. I'm going to jump back over here because I feel like there was a couple of questions uh, talking about playlists still. Yeah. Oh my God. I could talk about that all day. Yeah. The tech stuff. um, Yeah. If I'll be honest, if someone's going to cut you, like think, don't worry about technical stuff, having the eye line down and blah, 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 blah. If someone's going to cut you because you look down at the paper for two seconds and that's why they didn't want to cast you. Honestly, I think it's a little ridiculous and it probably isn't someone you want to work with. That sounds like a very toxic, like working relationship. If you just show up, be your best self, you know, bring the character. Um, I mean, didn't like Leah Michelle when she got cast in Glee, like she got in like an accident in the parking lot and like she told the pianist to stop. She was like, no, no, can you just start over like in the middle of her audition? And they were watching her and they were like, oh my God, it's her. Like it was the character standing there. Maybe a little bit of typecasting in that example, but bring yourself if it's a good fit you'll be a good fit don't like get too into your head um and yes breathing normally definitely that's a great tip um when you're saying your lines just relax you know just talk all right so here's a question in some film challenges it's common for writer directors to just cast their friends shouldn't they resist that and still have them audition that is a great question you're not going to like my answer (laughs) the answer is no So when you're making a movie, yes, it's for fun, especially if it's for a feature, especially if you want this to be a career, this is your job. This is your business. This is your work. You're not, you should always take time to, um, you know, be more inclusive, to work with people maybe you wouldn't have otherwise worked with, to expand your circle, to expand your network, to, you know, as you build yourself up, There's that um, expression, never look down on someone unless you're reaching down to bring them up to your level. Like you should always try to be as beneficial to the film community as you can. But at the end of the day, it's not your job to provide an opportunity for every single person in the world. It's everyone's job to provide as much opportunity as possible. And that's totally idealist. If you're doing a film challenge, if you're doing a 48 hour and you've literally have you know, 12 hours to write your script and another 15 hours to shoot it and that's it. And you know someone is perfect for the role and you just want to hand it to them. Or even, I mean, I've been given feature film scripts. We optioned a screenplay where I read it and I was like, oh my gosh, the lead actor for this is blah. And I literally told my husband about the character and I said, I think this needs to be gender swapped and she needs to play this. And he was like, yes. And we gender swapped it, did a little bit of rewrites. I sent her the screenplay. And I said, you know, what do you think? And she was like, oh my God, yes, this is totally my, like, this is my role. And and when we, you know, when we were doing the auditions and I was watching her with the people we were casting, she was so perfect. Like I didn't need to audition because I already had the person. If you never audition and you're only just casting your friends and you never expand your circle, that could be seen as being a little nepotistic and it also could be a little bit problematic. Um, But especially if you're in a film challenge, you're on a short time, you're on a very tight deadline, you're usually on a very low budget, you usually don't have a lot of access to things like a long, luxurious post-production time to fix things that went wrong on set. And unfortunately, sometimes it is a good idea to work with people who you know in those situations because you know them and you can trust them. And unfortunately, every time you bring in someone you've never worked with before, there's a little bit of a risk. And that's why during the audition process, it's so important to like give notes, see how they respond, see how they work with people, see how they work with each other, because you want to make sure this is a good fit. Filmmaking, unfortunately, is not like kindergarten. Everybody does not need to get along. You have to be nice to people, but you don't have to invite them all to your birthday party at the end of the day. It is annoying when a director always only casts their friends and never auditions ever and is only picking from their own circle. But at the end of the day, that director probably has a very specific thing in their head. And if they're already being so biased to their own, it's very possible that they wouldn't have space to allow you to bring everything you could bring to the table. And it probably wouldn't be a good working relationship. That's just my like thoughts on it. 
And even for that one thing, I think we offered, I offered two roles in that and we auditioned everything else. Um, so that's just, it, it is a production choice. As a producer, it is safer to work with people who you know they can do continuity. I will say though, I did once, I totally cast a friend in a role. I didn't even audition at all. It was two characters. I was like, okay. I was like, hey, you guys, let's make a movie. It'll be great. And I'd never worked with one of them on film. I'd only worked with them on stage. They could not duplicate emotion to save their life. And I didn't even notice because it was one of these really quick, like we're going to film this in a couple of hours type thing. And when we got to post, my husband looked at me and he was like, because <sighs> he was trying to edit it. And she literally picked up the cup different every single time. I don't think she ever did the line the same twice, ever. So yeah, those are all things to consider. At the end of the day, it is a personal choice of the production team and the director. Um, all right, script supervisors are your best friend. Yup. Uh, tell people why you aren't casting them. It, it's, I, I don't understand people who don't, who can't take two seconds to give a note. You know, you're going to be there all day casting anyway. Just pull them back in real quick. Let them know why. Give them some constructive criticism. Those couple of seconds could save someone so much anxiety and so much mental anguish. Like, it's, it's really worth it. Um, that's true. Bill Murray is in everything. Um, okay, good. Uh, Ron Howard. Some actors are non-actors. Yeah, that's true. Um, I've actually had better luck with non-actors sometimes. We've cast them in things where somebody comes in and comes in and auditions and I'm like, that was great. Usually because they're not like super in their head um, and because they're, they're not a trained actor, they're not like thinking about their technique. They're just like, oh, here's a character and they just do it. Um, acting advice. So, all right, now we're going to go into prep. I'm going to power through a whole bunch of stuff real quick. Um, this is going to kind of cross over a little bit into actual production, so just bear with me. I personally have a huge and extensive breakdown process. When I've got my script, um, I list out every hair and makeup style, wardrobe, uh, prop, sound note, cast, like where people are, when, what scene connects to another scene, like set design, VFX, prop cars, like everything. It's this massive, massive spreadsheet that I usually use for feature films. For a short film, you probably need to make a couple of notes, like if there is gonna be a passage of time and you want to have wardrobe continuity or something like that, but you need to at least break down a shot list. Make sure this includes coverage. I cannot stress this enough. Coverage means if you shoot a wide shot, you punch in and you shoot individual singles or you shoot a two shot of just the two of them or you shoot inserts to kind of break it up. Um, you have to have something you can break it up with while editing. It's very important for the director to be a part of this and to understand it because like I've been on location where we are running out of time. We've got two hours left and like three scenes to shoot and I don't have time. And as the director, I know in my head what coverage I need and I know how the scene is supposed to play. And I can say, look, let's drop this shot, this shot, this shot. We're just going to do this. And if I need to in post, we're shooting 4K. I can just punch into this one thing here or there because I was part of that whole development process. So having your director in early is very, very, very helpful. That isn't to say you need like a fully illustrated storyboard. I cannot be more like adamant about the fact that all that matters, all that matters when you're making a movie is the movie. It does not matter how you got there. It doesn't matter how cool your script looks or you know what editing software you use or how expensive your camera was or how much you paid somebody to draw like a Neil Gaiman comic book level storyboard. Use a piece of scrap paper and a Sharpie or go to like the dollar store and buy a little notebook and a pen. Literally, it does not matter. What's important is you have a list of the shots that you need. That's what matters. So you need to make sure it's enough that it can get you through your edit. Um, I'm gonna make a quick plug. Next week, my husband is doing one of these classes. It's called How to Not Fix It in Post. And he'll be going over more of like the editing and the production tips in depth. I highly recommend coming to that because I'm gonna breeze by a lot of this and he's gonna be talking about it for about an hour. Um, so have at least a note, like little piece of paper scribbled down. Even if you think you know it, even if like I got it in my head, you have way too much stuff in your head on set. Write it down. You're not a weak person if you make a note. Like you are a responsible person if you make a note. The director and the director of photography should really coordinate this ahead of time. Um, and if you don't have time for both of them to do it, the director needs to do it. Because as much as the DP might wanna be like, oh, but I'm the DP, it's the director telling the story. And if the shots the director needs to oversee the vision of the edit aren't there, then it doesn't matter. So um, 
Yeah, that's, uh, that's important. Okay, um, work out a general schedule. Look it up online. When does the sun set? When does the sun rise? Uh, if you need daylight, that's important. Plan for lunch. Uh, plan a little bit of space for something to go wrong. Um, keep in mind wardrobe changes and hair and makeup time and location moves and set dressing and all of that stuff. If you are shooting like a 48 hour, I know the OAF is a little bit of a longer challenge, but um, try not to include a billion details that can totally like derail you if like one domino doesn't fall in place perfectly. Um, try to stick to single locations, uh, low character count, little to no wardrobe changes. Um, the last 48 I directed, we shot it all over the world, literally all across America and in New Zealand. Everyone sent their footage to me virtually and it was a hot mess <laughs> and we did not get done on time. The last one my husband directed had two characters, two locations, and he was done under the deadline and we won. So don't make the job harder for yourself. I mean, it was fun. It was fun to do this crazy film project shot all over the world, but don't make your job harder than it needs to be. Sometimes you can really just lean into that simplicity. Um, to be fair, we did once do one of a cast of almost 10 people and we shot it all over this one house, but it was one house um, and it was nominated for best picture and my husband won best director, but we also had done a ton of prep work for it. So um, speaking of, plan your props and wardrobe and set. It doesn't have to be some super fancy period piece or high fantasy or massive science fiction, but like don't put someone in a white shirt in front of a white wall unless that's the style direction for the story. Plan what people are wearing. You can use the old Hollywood trick of putting background in muted colors and the lead character in something like red. Um, or other way around, if you want the lead character to look mousy, put people around them in very bright colors. Um, thinking about what your filming locations look like and style the wardrobe and your props and stuff to fit that. We were shooting in a, in a very brown toned house and I wanted a, uh, a fresh pre uh, fresh prints, a French press a coffee maker. And I got one that was like teal and it really stood out against the background because of the way the colors worked together. You know, if the walls are gray and your character is supposed to be monotonous, lean into that. If they're gray and you want your character to pop, put them in yellow or orange or something bright. Also try to set dress if you can. You don't have to do again, like you don't need to make the Harry Potter room of requirement for every scene, but just look at what's in your frame and set it up. So, you know, if it's supposed to be a frazzled mom at home, mess the place up, you know, the whole place, not just the space in front of her, but if you can see the space behind her, make it a mess, open drawers, throw knives and spoons, not, th don't throw knives, but, um, you know, knock over a glass, put some paper towels on, lean over a broom, like just make it feel very chaotic if the space is supposed to be chaotic. Um, if it's supposed to be very bare and stark, then do that, remove little knickknacks, you know, take, make counters very spacious and empty. Um, almost never are you gonna walk onto a location and just film and do nothing. I mean, it's amazing if you can, but sometimes like add some pops of color, throw some pillows around, add some texture with like throw blankets or something. If it's supposed to feel homely, add like knickknacks and books and like, you know, stuff. If it's supposed to be old and dusty, take some baby powder or some, or some flour and just kind of like go like this into the air and just let it settle and make it kind of have that dusty, grimy feel. But even if you're outside, pick up leaves and sticks that are randomly in your shot that don't fit there or pile up leaves and sticks if it needs to look a little bit more run down. Really create the space that you're filming in so that the location helps to tell your story. That's something that's really simple and can really elevate your project. I know this sounds like so much work, but Filmmaking is so much work, like it is, but the difference between a professional filmmaker and the stereotypical indie film, which is stupid because indie films have no reason to not be as professional as a studio film other than the knowledge and application of that knowledge to the production of the film in the first place. So it's a lot of work to put in work on the details, but that is something that will really make a big difference in your project. And there is a very vital role called a production designer who can help with all this like color palettes and styling and set dressing and wardrobe and hair, like all that stuff, just give it to them. Another thing to note about hair and makeup is that makeup for camera is not the same as makeup for life. That doesn't mean you have to like layer it on, especially with like super HD, 5 billion K, whatever. It's even more different, but unless your character is specifically not wearing makeup, like Sometimes a little lipstick, a little blush, a little, you know, something, brush or style their hair, 
watch it for continuity while you're shooting. Little things like that can add just a slight pop to the whole like look of the thing. It's the little things that, that do that. Um, very important, moving right along, work out who will be running your sound. Do not use the camera mic. Even if you're putting a mic onto your camera, do not use that. Use a boom if you can get it or lav mics. Coordinate with wardrobe so that it, they can be mic'd, you know, and it makes sense the mic pack isn't hanging out or awkwardly like bulging from whatever outfit they're wearing. Do not rely on the camera mic only. I cannot stress that enough. If you get nothing else <laughs> from this class, have a good story, get shots that are in focus, shoot coverage, have good actors, get good sound. Like that's literally like so, so, so important. Sometimes a great story can override all of these things, but more often than not, those things will kill a good story. Everyone jokes about room tone. There's all these like internet memes. I don't know why. I don't know why it's so funny. I think room tone is like so important. And to me, I find it a little unprofessional when people are like, oh, oh gotta get room tone. Like on all of my sets, when they say hold for room tone, everybody just shuts up and sits there. And then we keep going. Like everyone understands what, what it's for. So start making it weird to not get room tone instead of making it awkward to get room tone. Also, we have something on our <laughs> sets. It's called a JFS shot. And that stands for just for sound. We basically film with the boom mic guy, like walking or girl, walking through the set, like where we can see them on camera. We, we record it just so we can sync everything. But we have them just capture all the dialogue. If the actors are opening and closing drawers or opening their refrigerator, the mic is right there. It takes a few minutes to run each scene one more time, but it saves hours for your sound designer and your Foley mixer and your Foley recorders. Like all of these things that you probably don't even have now you've got to take, oh, they open the fridge, there it is, drag and drop. Oh, they close the drawer, there it is, drag and drop. And sometimes we do it once without dialogue so that they just get all of the background noises, their footsteps, the drawers opening and closing and all that stuff. So we just have it clean and we can drop it in. I really would love to see that on like every set as just a normal thing. I don't understand. It's so simple and so helpful. So um, yeah, it saves hours. Another thing that's really important is lighting. There is so much you can do with lighting and it does not have to be like a giant truck with thousands of dollars of lights. You can get a bounce from Amazon, like one of those nice like five way bounces that you can also use as a flag and as a diffuser. It's like 25, 30 bucks. If you can't afford that, literally go to the Dollar Tree and buy one of those big pieces of poster board that kids use for school. If you get a colored one, that can be kind of interesting or just get a white one. And literally don't even worry about like, oh, I feel so janky you're doing something to better the value of your production and all you had was a dollar. Don't be ashamed of that. Use what you have. So, um, you know, and you can use that, just put a little bit of extra light on your actor's face, fill a shadow to make their face look a little bit more rounded. If you want something to catch attention, put like a, a little extra light on it. If you need to use a flashlight app on your phone and stand there like this lighting people. I've done that for photos before where I just like, it was too dark and I just had two people with, with their flashlight apps on and then we took the picture. If you use a desk lamp and, you know, remove the shade and take some tinfoil and shape it to make like a funky angle and use it for like a film noir, like you can do so much and I totally recommend playing around with lighting um, because it's another one of those things that's the difference between, oh, I just turned on a light. Like don't just turn on your ceiling light and call it lit. Okay, great. You can see them. That's not lighting. That's just like ambience. Learn a little bit more about it so you can use, use it as a tool. Also, and this is huge, when you're looking for a director of photography, watch their reel and look at the lighting. Like I cannot tell you, a good DP understands not just camera, but light. I mean, photography literally means photography, writing with light. And a fancy shot demo reel with like all this cool camera motion and funky editing and crazy music, but the lighting is like boring or flat or uninteresting or unartistic. That's an amazing camera op and you should totally look at them for a camera op, but you need to find a DP who can work with lighting and camera because the purpose of the shot is not to make some sort of pimped out demo reel for the DP. The purpose of the shot is to capture the story and to shoot the style in a way that serves the moment on the screen. So it's not meant to be overly interesting to the point of distracting. It's meant to fill 
that moment of story with either a handheld or a zoom or a pan or any of these various different camera motions or camera setups or framing all of that and the light that goes into it and what in your scene is being called attention to or not all of that stuff is under the purview of the dp and when you're looking at reels for dps i can't tell you how many i've watched where they're great great camera work the lighting is just not there and i just skip them like i don't need a camera off i need a dp so um and if you're a dp make sure you learn lighting and make sure it's in your reel because it's really important directors set up your shots <laughs> have interesting blocking don't just have you know the person sitting in the corner like talking to the camera or something um maybe you can put the camera in the corner and have the room behind the person and have some depth maybe you want them to feel claustrophobic so you put them in a in a tighter spot play around with your staging there's a shot in the movie titanic where rose is getting kind of cinched into a corset while her mom is talking to her about this like basically arranged marriage and she's like pulling on her and originally it was written the other way around. Rose was going to be putting the corset on her mom, which does have a sort of subservient feel to it, but it is way more powerful for her mom to be like yanking her into this thing that's like completely constricting her and crushing her organs while telling her you have to marry this guy. And it's much more powerful as a scene. So remember that just because something was written a certain way, you can bring it to life. This is why it's so important that the script goes from the writer to the director, to the actress, to the editor, because it really needs that lifespan to have every element of life breathed into it. That's also a reason why it's so important to not overwrite your scripts and let the other departments really have time to focus on what they do. Um, if something isn't important, if it doesn't matter how she lifts the cup or what she hand she uses or that she lifts the cup at all, don't put it in the script. Just write what is absolutely vital for the story and for the other departments to understand how to bring the story to life. Um, this is also why tech scouts are so important, where to put lights, camera, all that stuff, general blocking walkthroughs before you shoot, because you can figure this all out. If you're on a time crunch, sometimes it's a little harder, but especially if you can't write the script ahead of time and then you're getting to your location and kind of rushing. But you know, while everyone's getting in wardrobe, doing hair and makeup, eating breakfast, like walk around with the DP and the director and look and, and get an idea of how you're gonna stage things um, or be familiar with the location before you write so that when the director sees the script, they already know the location and they can kind of think with it in their head. Um, then there are just some general logistics. Who's going to pick up lunch? <laughs> um, what are they getting? Where is it coming from? Uh, who's going to order? How does that all work? Do you need to order ahead? Um, what car is that person going to be driving? Uh, what vehicles does production need? Does our department need to jump ahead to another location to set it up and you only have one car and now no one can get lunch? Um, do you have a first aid kit? <laughs> who knows how to use it and who knows where it is? Um, are you going to be putting out snacks? And now in today's world, are you going to be doing that with COVID safety? Um, I didn't even get into COVID safety in this. That's a whole other category. Does anyone on set have an allergy? Probably, I say don't bring peanuts on set ever. That's such a common and deadly allergy. It's just not worth it. But sometimes sending a quick email to everybody, hey, quick question, does anybody have any you know, serious allergies we should be aware of, whether it's for animals or for um, food? Because you know, for all you know, your lead actor is definitely allergic to cats and you walk on set at the location and the owner has four cats and now your actor is puffy and swollen and their eyes are running and they're sneezing and they can't do their job. That's something that you can circumvent with a quick quick email ahead of time. Um, if you're shooting multiple days, where's wardrobe and hair and makeup and gear and all that stuff gonna stay? Um, does anything need to be washed or cared for or kept for continuity? Uh, what time are you returning to set the next day? Do people have time to sleep? Um, is there gear or props or things you have to pick up ahead of time? If so, who's gonna do that? Where is it gonna live until you're ready to use it? Um, Fun fact, it is so much easier to answer all of these questions where the answer isn't, I'm going to do it. Like build a team of people you can trust and work with because, you know, if you need to reach out to a local film school and see if maybe there's some students who would actually benefit from the opportunity to be on set and to work with you. And while they're on set, task them with real tasks. Don't treat them like minions. These are people who want to learn, who are here to help you. Be respectful of their time. They'll probably be respectful of you in return. And, you know, like they're helping you to make your film. So utilize that, um, teach them, help them grow. And for all you know, you could end up as a new, with a new co-collaborator of someone who started out as a PA. Um, 
I have a friend who has now taken home several Emmy Awards who started out as a production assistant on a TV show and moved up to associate producer. And now he works as a producer and it's fantastic. And he just showed up, did his job and did an amazing job. Make sure someone on set is responsible for all of these things. Do at least two takes of every scene, even if it's perfect the first time, no matter what. That two minute second take will save you hours in editing especially if you're on a deadline, just get the other take. We just did a project where my husband needed a shot of a woman getting off a horse. And in the background, there was a jogger wearing a mask running through, the, <laughs> running through. It was the only take, one take, that was it. I mean, he did a great job masking it out. You can't, the, the runner's gone and the woman comes in and gets down and, or no, she's not getting off a horse, she's looking around. And we needed that shot. And it took a lot of work to fix when they could have just taken, done another take. Um, and the DP should have said, hey, that shot, you know, somebody walked through. I need to redo that. All right, questions. I'm going to flip through this really quickly, and then we're going to post-production is going to get crammed in, just like post-production always is. Um, there's a lot of conversation happening here. That is awesome. I'm really excited about that, you guys. I hope people can connect here as well. Um, good sound, camera mic, I know. Room tone helps. JFS, all the way. You do not need expensive gear. Anybody who waves like a multi-million dollar camera in your face and um, is like bragging about the this and the that, if you can't shoot something amazing on your phone, you don't understand how to make a movie. It's not about your gear. You can find amazing gear for very cheap. Don't ever, feel, don't ever let budget stop you. Ever, ever, ever. It's the worst excuse. Um, Tanya's having chocolate, uh, cinematographers, lighting, yep. Um, yes, um, I do have an episode on the podcast on documentaries. I'm just for the person who asked about that. Um, and um, awesome. All right, post-production. So true to all post-production, it gets shoved down to the last minute. <laughs> and that sucks. I'm so sorry. Um, but also, like I said, my husband will be teaching that class specifically on how not to fix it on post. Do check that out. For now, I'm just going to touch on some main points. I'm going to go really quickly. So editing. General cutting of your film is so important for rhythm and style. Yes, great editors can save a crappy production team from bad cinematography or even weak acting performances or awful continuity. But in a perfect world, the footage they have is good to start with and they don't have to fix it in post. So when editing, the most important thing is to cut it in a way that tells the story. Sometimes, you know, don't just establish cut, 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 next scene, cut, cut, cut. Like, you can do something called intercutting, which is where you take pieces of one, like this scene happens and this scene happens and you kind of cut them like that. Um, you can pull audio from one shot and have, you know, maybe you hear the car before you see it, or maybe you see the car while the audio from the other scene is carrying in. You can do a lot of stuff with the way you put everything together. Editing is the ultimate sandbox because you can do anything and the editor has the ultimate privilege of every other person on set doesn't get to see it. They're imagining it in their head. They're building it as they go. They're putting it together out of the air. And then the editor gets to sit there and look at it and be like, yeah, that was wrong. That's pretty good. That You could have done that better. Because they get those pieces. So use that as the editor and use it to amplify the work that was done by the rest of your team. And hopefully they did a good job and didn't dump you with a pile of garbage to work with. Always cut to the story. Uh, just get it on the timeline. Even if you need to trim for time, cut away what you can without losing the story. But the first thing before anything else is lock your picture cut. Get it to where, even if the audio is bad and you have to fix stuff and there's effects needed and color grading and things you need to deal with, just get the picture locked and then you can work on that. Otherwise, you're gonna start working on something, change the edit, and now you have to fix that again. And it just wastes so much time. It also can make your computer go slower um, if you're like running adjustment layers while you're editing. Um, but um, yes, having the editor on set um, is helpful as well. I'm not gonna dive too much into that because I wanna save some for my husband's class. Um, but don't get into sound mixing and sound design and score and all that stuff. Lock your cut first. Um, then send it for effects and audio mixing and score and start your color grading all at the same time because they can all be working concurrently while the cut is locked. Color grading is super important. It's just a little bump of polish. Uh, don't just drag and drop a LUT. Um, a LUT, for anyone who doesn't know, it's an acronym for a lookup table. 
And um, it's basically a preset or save settings of color grading. It's kind of like you're dropping an Instagram filter on it. And it may not actually work. I'm sure you've gone through your Instagram filters and you put one on and you're like, oh, that's terrible. So don't just drag and drop because even if it looks good on one shot, it might not look good for the whole film. So at least check it. As with anything in film, be intentional. Like do it with purpose, do it with a reason. Also lean into sound, give moments for your story and characters to just exist. You know, build a world around them beyond just what they see, but what they hear. Um, maybe a story takes place during a major storm. You don't even need to show it. Just board up the windows and have that sound of a hurricane happening outside. Um, mix your dialogue. I cannot stress that enough. Nothing screams more during like a screening. We've all been there and we're sitting there and whoosh, whoosh, as one mic turns on and off. And it's so obvious. So if you didn't get clean audio, if you can't get rid of it, if you're running out of time, just drop a little crossfade on the end, just blend it in so that it kind of comes and goes gently. It's not going to totally fix it, but it makes it a little less shocking and it's super quick to fix that. When it comes to the score, you can edit to pre-existing music. This is my personal preference though, unless you're making a music video, why? Like you don't, the, what's important is your story, not the music, as much as I love music. Your story and the emotion of every moment should be allowed to breathe as long as it needs to, not cut because that's where the drum beat is. So I know tons of people who cut uh, scratch tracks and um, you know, some people even uh, like that's their thing is, is cutting the music and that's totally fine. Again, what works for you? I personally say lean into the story. Um, try to have an original score written to the film that you cut, even if there's themes and things like that kind of being developed. Even if you drag and drop music after it's cut, sometimes you can play with it and make it really fit the story instead of trying to make your story fit the score. Again, a film isn't a music video. So um, do try not to use like action sequence 732 from some random website. Like try to find something original when it comes to your music. Um, if it's a piece on a train, try and find something with like this train-esque sort of chugging rhythm to it. If it takes place in the rain, maybe lean into that and have that sort of like torrential element added to the score. Give characters their own themes. There's so much that you can do with music. I know this seems like super high and mighty goals for a film, especially if it's on a deadline, but if you plan ahead of time, you know, you can even bring your script to your composer at the beginning and have them start kind of like getting some ideas before you even film. You can actually work these things out and then go from there and kind of have it all come together in post. Lastly, your end credits. Include everybody who works on your film, spell their name right, make sure you credit them properly. Try not to have a long, powerful opening sequence. It's awesome that you want your name up there and you want to tell the world who you are. Like anything in film, don't tell them, show them. Show them your film and then say a film by and have that splash across the screen after their like mind is blown from watching your amazing work. And then make sure you include the little copyright. This film is a work original. Any relationship to characters, real or fiction, is purely coincidental, blah, 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 blah. And that's it. I've got four minutes for questions. <laughs> Sorry for rushing through that. I really wanted to make sure I was able to kind of get through everything. I'll jump in over here. Yes. Audio is so, so, so important. Having the editor on set can absolutely help, especially when it comes to reshoots and pickups. You can see it right there when you're on the ground, have your location, have your people know what you need to film. If you have time, uh, re have, have the um, actors retrack their audio. I hate letting go and trusting the editor. Thoughts? Um, no. Uh, I, can, I can comment on that. Wait, hey, hang on. You get your class next week. Okay. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I'm Sorry, that was random. Just edit that part out. <laughs> um, so, um, <laughs> um, no one says you have to. There's nothing that says. Now, obviously, you want your editor to have space to do their job. The editor is not the director. And this is something that I have seen many times, and I've definitely seen with other editors, not my husband, um, specifically not my husband, but I've, I've definitely seen this where the editor has this sort of like God complex of, it's my turn now, just you let me, let me do this. And that's not a good collaborative space for anybody. My husband and I have a great working relationship where the director usually does a rough cut 
and then the other one, sometimes one of us will edit it, usually it's him if it's just an editor situation, and then the director will come in and do a pass, or the director will do a rough cut and then the editor will kind of come in and, and spice it up and punch it up and make it like better. You do have to get past your ego in a little bit that it always helps have another set of eyes. Someone is gonna see something, both my husband and I infallibly have said, I had to take that shot, I had to make that cut because there was no way else to do it. And we had genuinely tried. And the other person looked at it and figured it out and fixed it. And um, that's um, just something to keep in mind. Make sure your editor is someone you can collaborate with and someone you trust and someone like an actor who's gonna take your notes. Make sure your editor can take your notes too because they are not the director and you don't have to give it over to them. They are working for you. I'm gonna, there was another question about the music. So uh, to grab music quickly, um, Tanya, there is a great website um, that we do use um, called hitrecord.org. The only thing is you cannot use anything on that site without the express permission of the artist. And you have to make sure it is entirely that artist's original work or get permission from everybody who collaborated on it. But more than once, we have reached out to an artist whose music we like the sound and feel of before the project, reach out to them, get their permission, get their email address, send them a release form and have them sign it. And then we just fill in whatever track it is that we're using. Also, obviously my husband is an amazing composer. Um, I will also add, we do offer free consultations for people. You can schedule one-on-one, -on -one, 30 minute to an hour, where we'll just, you know, if you wanna talk about your project, if you wanna talk about a specific piece of a project, you wanna ask more direct questions, it's something that we offer as available on schedule basis. It's usually on a Monday, but we try and be flexible. Um, but if that helps anybody, it's on our website, spacedreamfilms.com. That's single space, single dream, plural films.com. And you can just click on consults. And um, it does say that there is a rate on a by, by project basis. That's not for the first one. The first one is always free. So if we can help you at all, if you wanna pick our brains or whatever, and then obviously the podcast is available for anybody who wants it. And then I will also make a shameless plug. My husband is a brilliant composer and musician. We also have people that we love working with. So if you ever want to reach out to us, we're happy to connect you. We love our network and we love the people who we work with and we love bringing them in for other projects. We love getting them work. So if you are in needing of something, um, you can totally ask us and we're happy to make a referral or make a recommendation. You can email info at spacedreamfilms.com. And uh, that's the general email box for pitches and questions and requests and stuff like that. Awesome. Whew, I got through it all. Um, thank you all so much for coming. I hope this was helpful. I know I kind of powered through a ton of information and we just barely scratched the surface on all of it. There's no way to cover everything, but those are some things that you can use that most people don't that really will elevate your project and give you a little bit of an edge in a competition, a little bit of an edge in a festival. So yeah, and just because I have a little bit of uh, stuck on my head on this, I will say um, about the whole casting thing, like should directors cast their friends or hold auditions, that director is gonna be putting themselves on set in a position where they are completely responsible for everything that happens. Every set piece, wardrobe, camera angle, line of dialogue, they're responsible for. And it, that can be hard. And sometimes as a director, it can be, it can help both mentally and just professionally to know, okay, I can lean on this person for this. I can lean on this person for that. And it, it really is a two-way street of just respecting the director's position and understanding that people really should be given chances to audition and you should learn and grow your network and all that stuff. We've met some amazing people through the casting process and through reaching out in Facebook groups and stuff like that. So um, I just want to say, I hope I wasn't too harsh by saying, no, the director shouldn't have to hold auditions. I just wanted to balance that out a little bit because I felt like I was very, a little too punchy there. And then, yes, I didn't even talk about an AD. I, I had such a, I, I, I thought about it, putting that in there managing your background, making sure your talent is ready for set, managing your schedule, doing your schedule in the first place. A good line producer will help you with a budget and breakdown. A good AD can schedule everything for you, keep you on schedule, manage all the departments so that the director can just sit there and focus on the creative and telling the story. Um, so that those are very important things that I didn't even have a time to talk about. 
wonderful. I really appreciate everybody and everybody's awesome questions. Yeah, I would be honored to come back and, and do more. I, I had a lot of opportunity with mentorships and inter- I did a lot of interning and a lot of apprenticeships. I applied to a lot of places when I first started working in film. And if it wasn't for other people taking time to help me, I wouldn't have been able to have the opportunities to learn. So if I can share my slight sliver, I mean, I learn more every day. I'm sure in 10 years, um, the, uh, I'll look back at this and be like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. Probably in two years, I'll say that. But I hope it's helpful. Take from it what you what you can. Um, feel free to reach out to us directly either through our website um, or through email or through the OIF page. Thank you again, everybody. Um, this was an awesome experience and I'm glad I was able to do it. Thank you. Yay. I don't know how to it, so I'm just going to be that awkward person. Oh, it's still recording. Um, that was part two of the workshop. A big thank you again to the Organization of Independent Filmmakers and to everyone who participated in the workshop. Okay, that's it. Bye. You've been listening to Filmmaking Actually with Cora Linda, Space Dream Productions podcast. Subscribe to us on any or all the podcast platforms, but we especially recommend our sponsor, Anchor. If you like what you hear, leave us five-star ratings and positive reviews on iTunes and Stitcher. It helps more listeners like you discover the show. But the best thing you can do if you really like the show is tell a friend. Want to leave a comment or ask a question? Email at filmmakingactually at gmail.com. This is Spacey speaking. And remember, you know why Matthew McConaughey finally published that book, right? Why? Because you got tired of saying, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> now you can say, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote. <laughs> and we'll see you next time.